Hi, Soraya. Hi, Missy. How are you? I'm good. I'm so happy to see you. It just brings me such joy every time I get to spend time with you. Oh, that's so nice. I love talking to you. All these conversations, they always leave me thinking more things. Yeah, I, I just think it's really great. Um, I want to thank you for joining me today um, and being my special guest and also our keynote speaker for our Women oh, in Mortgage yeah. Conference. It's, happen. it's going to happen. It is. I'm so yeah, thrilled. Your hard work and persistence. I know it's been long, long coming. It has. It has. And I'm excited about it. So um, would you do me a favor and introduce yourself to um, the people who watch our lovely and amazing Facebook Live? Sure. Um, well, I'll start by saying that we met at a political women's rights conference, really what it was. Um, and I think both of us had come to that conference after many years of working on the issue of women's political lives, health, social well-being. Um, and really, I mean, in my case, I started, uh, I don't really remember a time that I wasn't thinking about these sorts of things. And I started writing about them in college and, um, and then took my feminist self into the workplace thinking that you know, there would be progress and moving forward, things would just keep changing and getting better. And that was just simply clearly not the case because our <laughs> institutions um, are inherently conservative and um, stubborn and change is slow. Mm -hmm. um, but about 10, 11, 12 years ago, I left a, a career really in media and data technology uh, to go back to writing full time and to feminist activism, which I've been doing since then. Uh, and that work has involved writing about the role of um, identity, gender and race and um, power in virtually any sphere, religion, education, finance, um, politics. Uh, and eventually, I consolidated a lot of my thinking in a book that I published two years ago called Rage Becomes Her. It's so is, good. Oh, thank you. Which is kind of a Trojan horse for all of these issues. What is the state of um, equality today? Uh, how does it affect us all? But particularly, how does inequality touch women's lives at every stage of life and sphere of life? Yeah. Um, and I wrote it after the 2016 election because that seemed like such a shock to the system for many people. Mm -hmm. But for uh, those of us who had been doing work, particularly in reproductive justice, mm -hmm. it wasn't that big a shock. It was really okay. just uh, kind of put your face in your hands and wish you were wrong moment. It really was like the, I think it was a moment and, and you know, what was really interesting for me as, you know, this coach and this, you know, this person who's like coaching women and running my own business. And all of a sudden I ended up having all of these women who had supported Donald Trump mm -hmm. coming to me and saying, I don't have a voice. And you seem to be someone who is really interested in helping women have a voice. And that was the moment when I realized we actually are more alike than different when it comes to having being able to express ourselves in our communities as women and and it was really an interesting turning point for me personally because I was like wow like we still have a long way to go as women supporting women right and then Liz came to me and said hey you've got experience putting on conferences I'm tired of listening to the same old dudes get on a stage and tell me how to work with my clients in the mortgage industry. Like she's been in the mortgage industry for like over 20 years. And she's like, I want to put together a conference of women for women where it's women and women of color on the stage so that women can come together and connect and talk about how they serve their clients in the mortgage industry in a completely different way. And it was all about disruption in this in the in the finance industry because as we know one of the most racist sexist places in the in the country and indeed the world is in the finance industry 
Yeah, I mean, it's funny, right? Because sometimes I really laugh when I see I'm reading a newspaper or, or something and it, and it says she was in a male dominated industry. <laughs> Like, and which would not be those if they aren't related to sort of proto maternal things, right? Like yeah. teaching and being administrative assistants and um, nursing. I mean, if you think about the, the fields in which women dominate in the mm -hmm. service industries and in the healthcare industries, they are fundamentally doubling down on sex segregation and gender norms, right? They are roles in which women are expected to be sacrificial with their time and their emotions and their labor and to fulfill that societal role of caring for others. All the others are male dominated. And in those, I think, you know, I think a lot of people think, well, we need diversity, we need diversity, but there's a real difference between diversity and inclusion. And the conference, as you just described it, is in a, is I think a, a recognition that diversity exists and is important, mm -hmm. but to to make it go into the field of inclusion yes. would be I think to say, listen, men, here is a bank, no pun intended, of knowledge and expertise and wisdom that you have closed the doors of this of this sector mm -hmm. um, to, mm -hmm. and that's I think the case in many industries because you know we we often find ourselves in rooms with other women mm -hmm. who are already confident extremely experienced are experts and what they lack is institutional regard status and power yes i love what you just said about institutional regard status and power because one of the things that uh, we've been talking about in our interviews with other women in the mortgage industry and especially so we've there's this difference between the women in the C-suite and these executive women that have made it all the way from being women producers in mortgage up to the top, which, by the way, are few and far between yeah. and very rarely women of color. Right. And then these women producers who are, by the way, by and large, I mean, these women are making for the mortgage industry billions of dollars a month, a mm -hmm. month, not a year, right, but a month, month cause it's bananas. And one of the things that, that Liz and I were, I really love your opinion on this. Cause we were talking about this, you know, what happens, what do you think it is about? So the, these guys get together in the industry and they do golfing and, you know, they're going fishing and they're like connecting with each other. And, and that's about building connections. But they, women don't do that. We don't, we don't, well, I mean, we can, I, I, but we're not invited with the men to go and engage in those activities. And, and so, what, how do we respond to that? Like, how do we deal with that? Well, I mean, in the first case, we can't, right? Because we, we suffer from time poverty. Yeah. And this imbalance in time results in all these gaps in leisure time. Mm -hmm. But what we often think of as leisure time is in fact professional networking time. So golfing is leisure, but it's also building relationships. Yes. So as long as intimate inequality exists, where women are doing the vast bulk of unpaid domestic and care work, um, this is gonna be a problem. Yes. And so, you know, I think sometimes people really want to maintain a big, thick wall between public and private life, but the public and professional inequalities that exist are enabled because of private inequities, right? And the thing is, in the senior ranks of any industry, there is a cohort of people, men, who generally speaking have stay-at-home spouses and that is a professional asset in a society in which the ideal worker is a man who has no, he doesn't, he has a default person that does everything else, mm -hmm. right? And women don't have that default person. Right. We just, even, you know, the few women that may be in a heterosexual relationship that have a stay at home husband mm -hmm. um, are in their minority, yeah. you know? And so first of all, you have, the situation that it's very heteronormative, very heteropatriarchal. Yep. Um, and so it favors married straight men, mm -hmm. that entire allocation of time and power and resources. But we don't think of that as a transfer of wealth from women to men. We don't think of time as a wealth transfer. 
But all of those opportunities to rest, to relax, to build relationships, to network, to socialize, those evaporate if you're a woman. Yeah. You know, I mean, th that makes a huge difference. And so I think that there's this very complicated dynamic between the institutional change that has to happen. So right. don't- Sorry, my wait. dog just freaked out on a squirrel. <laughs> Get me to death. That's so funny. Um, Go ahead, come here. Anyway, I'm just saying that there's this relationship. You know, there's very little that any one individual woman can do yeah. to address the systems that continue to reward. And we just saw what happened with COVID. Three million plus women left the paid workforce. And yeah. it's so aggravating because when I, I've been watching this for months now, people will interview women and they'll say, what made you choose to leave work? And you're just like, seriously? Like you're like you had a choice? About choices, you know? And you you really just want to throw something at the person to say, please, this is not a question of choice. You think these women have literally they woke up that morning and said, I just think I'll stop working today because I choose to and I want to. Yeah. You know, it's just it's such a profound um belief system, the separate sphere belief system that generates this. And, and it generates this, not just by imposing it on us, but by being woven into our sense of self and identity. You know, yeah. if you're a woman and you're a good woman and you have a family you love, you want to do this. You want yeah. to take care of them. I'm not saying that that's wrong or should be punished. I'm just saying that the entire system is set up to punish you if you don't want to, or God forbid, there's so many millions of women who can't afford to, yeah. right? I mean, what about the women who don't have a high wage, a higher wage earning spouse, mm -hmm. or, you know, need to be able to be the primary wage earner for a, an extended family or are taking care of parents and children? Yes. That's not a choice that women are making, you know, it's... It isn't. And, and one of the things that you're bringing up that I would love to talk about for a minute is shame. So these women that we've been talking, women producers in mortgage, these are the ones who are loan officers, like they are doing these loans and they are making so much money, so much money. And then they feel bad for pulling themselves out of poverty and making money. I was just talking to a woman literally this week and you know, this week isn't that long. And I was just talking to her this week and she's like, I came from nothing and I have, you know, I am making so much money, Missy, and mm -hmm. I feel terrible about it. And I'm like, well, and I don't know the context of her situation, but this is why, again, I always go back to the personal and interpersonal in, in relationships where women make more money than men, mm -hmm. they lie about it. Yep. when they are reporting income. Yep. Both the man and the woman will inflate his income and reduce her income. You know, and wow. this is just gobsmacking, right? Yeah. And that implies shame on both. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I think that maybe, you know, if we can talk about Me Too for a moment, because I think this is very relevant. Mm -hmm. um, Me, Me Too is very unsettling for the entire society. Mm -hmm. But I think that these conversations about social norms and what constitutes the truth and uh, memory and all that stuff okay. is really just the icing on masculinity and the, and the obstacle that our social norms about uh, masculinity have created. Because if, if you're a man and you have been working hard and you wanna be a good person, chances are fairly high in the United States that you associate being a good man with providing and protecting. Right. And Me Too challenges both of those in mm -hmm. their efficacy and their um, validity, but both. Because yes. in Me Too, what women are saying is, I want to provide for myself. I want to make money. I want to be professionally successful. I don't want to be molested and and assaulted when i'm at work yeah. and that is inhibiting my leadership and my income potential all of that right it's women right. literally saying get real we work stop punishing us yeah. let us be successful without this uh, threat of assault but the flip side of that is also by the way 
you're protecting me, that's a big myth. You can't yeah. protect me. You can't protect me when I go to school, get on the bus, go to work, travel. Like yeah. any man trying to protect the women in his life is going to have a complete mental breakdown if he stops to really think about what that means. Yeah. And so Me Too says, you're not really protecting me and I don't really want you to provide for me. And the logical response to that is a kind of identity protective cognition, which is, this can't be true. It's an exaggeration. Seriously, don't, you know, you're, you're crying victim. Like all this stuff that deflects from what women are saying. Yeah. I think that it's really interesting how these things are so intertwined and they come together in so many different ways. One of the things that Liz and I, in the very beginning of creating this conference and creating this space, we knew intentionally that we wanted to disrupt the way women in mortgage are treated, the way they talk about their wealth and their income, the way they are spoken to about how to make money, like how to, you know, yeah. bring in more money for the industry. And, you know, it's a very masculine way of, of talking about money and clients and client interaction. And one of the things that we really ran into very early was the Liz and I had a conversation about, well, can we say that this is a feminist conference? Can we use the word feminism? Because there are many of the women that are in the mortgage industry consider themselves more conservative. Yes. They're, um, you know, they're not these like progressive leaning liberal people, even though a lot of those women do exist in the industry, but this is a typical, you know, it's finance. So it's a typically right. more conservative industry. Yeah, it, uh, inherently. And also for women of color, feminism might seem very sort of white focused, right? Like if you're a woman right. and you've already had not good experiences with white feminism, yes, that's not gonna, that's not gonna be appealing. No, it's not at all. And so I was wondering if we could talk just really quick before we wrap up about why is the word feminism still <laughs> such a nasty F word? It's, you know, I, I've, I've just spent 10 months writing about trauma and resilience. And the funny thing is feminism is traumatic to patriarchy, right? Right. It is. It's yeah. like inflicting a big whopping trauma on the entire society. <laughs> and, and what I say to kids when I talk in high schools, I'm like, think about this, right? You grow up and you hear the word racist, it's bad. You hear the word sexist, it's bad. You hear racism, it's bad. You hear sexism, it's bad. You've got all these isms that are bad. And then all of a sudden, someone says to you, feminism. And you're like, well, that follows this kind of linguistic format of neg negative things, right? Yes. And, and it's very difficult. And it's not like we throw the word feminism at kids early on, right? We are getting maybe in some parts of the country a little more um able to say racism to describe racism god forbid we actually talk about white supremacy but even the word racism people have a greater fluency with racism than even a year ago right yeah. they, they can mm -hmm. say the word and not feel tense yeah um, which is quite shocking i mean it's 2021 right so <laughs> anyway but all the isms tend to be bad and in waltz's feminism and we're supposed to get kids to understand, oh, it's not like the other isms, right? And I think that's hard. I think the construction of the word itself is problematic from that perspective. Yeah. Um, and, and I do think that, um, I, I do think it's traumatic to the society. I, I do think that it's always radical. Feminism is always, always pushing, yeah. you know? And people don't like that. Mm -mm. You know, but without the pushing, <laughs> look, where would we be? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I think that's such a really, I love that. I can't wait to read what you're writing about. Uh, I really love that because, um, because we have seen that pushing how afraid women, the women that we've interviewed, the women that we talk to about leadership and having a seat at the table and how do you invite more people in and how can we be more representative of the people who are buying and selling houses? Like, you know, we, that pushing makes them so uncomfortable. And I just, I really love that. And I love um, the idea because it goes into this, I think the trauma goes into the shame about how we don't admit that we are making money hand over fist as women. Right. right? I mean, yeah. the, shame, the shame is debilitating, right? Yeah. And, and I would say that the shame really comes from a sense that 
um, even the desire to make money makes you a bad woman. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Even the desire to be self-sufficient in our society as a woman conflicts with these ideals of femininity yeah. and masculinity yeah. that we absorb as yeah. children. We absorb it in the air. You know, yeah. it comes from the watching our families and it comes from being in school. I mean, look at schools, right? Schools, primarily women are teachers, but men are administrators. The higher up the food chain you go in a school, the more men there are. Women concentrated in um, early education, men concentrated in um, higher and upper. Higher education, yep. So any kid going into our education system, we may say the words as we all do about equality and you know, uh, you know, meritocracy, but any kid who is aware of the world around them sees fewer and fewer women with power yeah. as they get older yeah. and understands how that works. Yeah. You and know? that's exactly reflected in the mortgage industry too, Soraya. Like it's right. like, you know, women are doing the groundwork and men are up in the C-suite having a great old time living right. the high life off those women that are doing that work at the ground. Well, and again, highly racialized, right? Yes. yes. Like, you know, there it's not a joke when you say that even the most successful black woman in any industry on yes. any given day or yep. brown woman yep. can be asked if she's part of the janitorial staff. Oh yeah. hundred percent. One hundred percent that happens. Yep. And that just says everything about the environments that we work in mm -hmm. and the cultures that we continue to cultivate. <laughs> I gotta say, I, I was, um, I wrote an article with my wonderful writing partner, Catherine um, Booney a few years ago and we won a prize for it. And so we went to this award ceremony and it was 11 o'clock in the morning. It was kind of strange because we walked into this grand building in New York and there was a red carpet and there were media magnets and they, there were like pictures happening. and we were just like, what is going on? It's like a glam fest in here. And we've got on like our, our turtlenecks and, and, and we're just kind of marching on in there. And so we're standing waiting for our badges to go in. Mm -hmm. And these guys who were sort of industry leaders came off of this red carpet and we were standing right at the end. And this man looks at me and he says, where are you whisking me off to next? And I- No, I, he didn't. Oh yeah, he did. And I didn't, I, didn't, um, I, I kind of smiled and, and I said, I'm not actually a whisker. Like I'm not whisking you off anywhere. And he didn't quite understand what I meant. And, and I said, but this young man can help you as the man handed me my badge. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of a very typical possible interaction that you might have. And so I, I did write about this in my book. It, there was some schadenfreude in winning the prize that day because we had to get up and go to the stage and get it. And I'm like, damn, it's amazing, you know, that that can still just be his assumption that yeah. I'm literally just there to make the path of his experience better. Yep. Yeah. And I think women do that to women too. All the time. And, and that's really what we really want to, I'm so glad you're on this journey of disruption with Liz oh, and I, because I just, and I hope that the people watching and listening, like this gives them a clue to what we're going to be talking about oh, in the conference, so be, because we're really going to be pushing the envelope at the conference. And I'm excited about it. And I think it is because we're having diverse voices. We're not just going to have, you know, all of the voices that are coming in are from multiple political backgrounds yeah. and you know, they, we are building a stage that is representative of women all over, right? Like we're not, we're not just talking to, you know, very typical women. We've got people coming in that have, represent all different backgrounds and veterans and disabilities and but yeah. they're all, and they're all women. And that is the part of this that I'm really, really, really excited about. So Soraya, thank you so much for being here. And, um, and, um, um, I'm just so happy you're speaking at the conference. It's just so delightful. And um, everybody go, go get Soraya's book, Rage Becomes Her. It's such a wonderful book. And um, you can follow Soraya on all the socials. That's actually how we met was on Twitter. And we had a big like fangirl moment when we got to see each other in person in DC. So Soraya, thank you so much for your thank time. You. And um, I love your face. 
Ah, me too. Bye. Have a good Bye. rest of the day. You too.